access to the to the Zoom call so we can get started. So I'd like to welcome everybody to our first quarter um, pediatric readiness recognition program community of practice of the year of 2023. So happy new year to everyone. Haven't probably seen you all together at, at one time yet. So it's it's great to see you all join. Um, appreciate you getting on today because I know everyone has lots going on, conflicting, conflicting priorities, so on and so forth. So you know. um, I'm joined today by my colleagues, um, Michelle Megling, who um, co-leads the NPRP steering committee and hospital domain. And then you'll also hear from our leader, um, Dr. Kate Remick today as well, as we um, talk a little bit about um, today's topic is disaster and um, brainstorming ways or giving you ideas and resources as well as hearing from um, you all how you perhaps are incorporating pediatric disaster plans into your recognition programs and the importance of that. Um, I, I'm gonna take this, this brief opportunity to go ahead and give you an idea of the plan that we have kind of for the really the, the rest of the year as we think about um, a launch in September at the um, all grantee meeting. So as some of you may or may not know, this um, program has been um, um, around for a while and we are fortunate to have 18 states on board that have official recognition programs in their state. We have a lot of other states doing great work and are super close. So that's exciting. Um, that collaborative was in, um, I believe, 2016-ish, I might get that date, that year wrong. But um, my point being is that we're now ready to expand into the EMS um, realm as well. So our quarterly call in April will focus um, a little bit about, um, or not a little bit about, we'll focus about EM, on EMS recognition programs. Um, I believe there are seven or eight states that have formal EMS recognition programs. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And this is all in preparation for the launch of our next um, facility recognition collaborative um, or PEDS ready recognition collaborative. I, I continue to use those terms interchange interchangeably and I apologize. We're really trying to um, now call it the pediatric readiness recognition program as it incorporates both EMS and hospital. So that launch will happen at the all grantee meeting in um, September. So really kind of using this year, if you will, to kind of gear up for what that might mean and helping you all start some conversations and think about what that might look like. And trauma, thank you, Kate. <laughs> it does include trauma as well. So um, I will turn it over to Michelle. Oh, we're gonna start with Kate, I'm sorry. We're gonna start with Dr. Remick to give a little bit of background of the significance of um, all this work and disaster plans incorporating the disaster work that's been done within the EIC. Um, as you all know, um, I'll take the opportunity now to just acknowledge our um, disclaimer on the screen. Um, in summary, um, this disclaimer notes that we are funded by HRSA and that during this presentation are those of um, the speakers and not necessarily those of HRSA or the U.S. government. All right, I will turn it over to Dr. Remick. Yeah, and I don't have much much to say. I just wanted to kind of set the stage for this and I'm going to pass it on to um, Michelle Meglin, but. Um, as many of you know, uh, disaster preparedness plans are part of the National Pediatric Readiness Assessment. And in fact, in the NPRP assessment, we ask about seven or so questions related to the presence of pediatric disaster plans. And in 2013, when we did this assessment, we found that less than 50% of hospitals reported having a pediatric disaster plan in place. And certainly the most recent surge has really um, begun to shed light on the importance of this. Um, about uh, four or five years ago now, uh, the assistant, now they changed their name. It used to be the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. It's now the Administration for Strategic Planning and Response um, had put out a call that all um, hospital preparedness programs needed to develop a pediatric annex, and that pediatric readiness was one of the performance measures that um, they were highlighting. And for those of you who were aware of that work happening within your state, you'll know that many of those programs and healthcare coalitions, the plan was 
oh, well, we'll just send our kids to the children's hospital. And as all of you know, there just aren't enough children's hospitals to be able to um, uh, accommodate the needs of the entire pediatric population. You all know about 80% of kids are seen in non-children's hospitals and emergency departments. Um, over the last 10 years, some of you may see, have seen reports in New York Times and other uh, media outlets that have come out stating that pediatric inpatient units have closed to the tune of about 20% of hospitals. And in fact, in the most recent um, National Peds Ready Assessment in 2021, um, we asked this question again, and we found that from 2013, we dropped from about 50% of hospitals reporting the presence of a pediatric inpatient ward to about 30% of hospitals reporting a pediatric inpatient ward. We've also seen a decrease in the number of PICU beds. And so what this is to say is that the inpatient capacity to meet the needs of children has been on a steady decline. Um, and with this recent viral surge, it's really highlighted um, that lack of capacity that exists on a national scale. We've You've all seen, you know, children who have been transferred across state lines to be able to find inpatient beds. Um, there's a lot of frustration for families, a lot of added stressors, a lot of added costs. Um, and this is why there's a real opportunity to begin looking at um, disaster plans as um, part of the work that we do around pediatric readiness. Um, now with the Pediatric Pandemic Network that's taken off and the Pediatric Centers of Excellence that have been funded um, uh, through ASPR, uh, there's now even greater opportunity for collaboration um, and support of this. And for those of you who don't know, um, the most recently funded Pediatric Disaster Center of Excellence is the G7 group, which is along the whole um, southern uh, border and southern seawall, so from Texas to Florida and encompassing Puerto Rico as well. So lots of really great work happening around pediatric disaster work. And they add on in addition to um, the initial Great Lakes region, now called Region 5 for Kids, which is the Ohio, Michigan, Great Lakes area extending into Ontario. And then of course, the, the second one, which is the RAPM group, which is the Western um, Regional Alliance, which is um, the entire Western seaboard. So um, there's lots of great work happening in disaster. And when this most recent performance measure came out um, about making sure pediatric or making sure all hospitals have pediatric disaster plans, um, we thought that this was a real opportunity to highlight the ways in which you might consider revising uh, your pediatric readiness criteria to include disaster plans if they don't already. Or for those of you who are in the development of um, pediatric readiness recognition programs, really thinking, about, <laughs> oops, really thinking about how you will incorporate disaster plans. So there's been lots of great work that's come from this. Um, this started in 2014 uh, when the National Resource Center, uh, falling on the heels of the NPRP assessment, had led an effort to develop a pediatric disaster preparedness checklist for every hospital. And that has recently been revised. Um, and there's a new toolkit. And so Michelle is going to talk a lot about that and um, what components you might be able to incorporate into your recognition program. Okay. So, Can you guys hear me okay? So yeah. just touching base on some of the national performance measures, um, 1.1 with the hospital emergency department pediatric readiness recognition program, which Kate talked about, and also capturing and having those PECs or pediatric emergency care coordinators in every hospital emergency department that we can. Um, our national performance measure um, 1.4 is hospital emergency department disaster plans. Um, looking at the percent of hospitals with an ED that have an, a disaster plan that addresses the needs of children. And that's gonna be really our focus today. Um, we've always had this for many years in our pediatric toolkit. Um, are your hospitals pediatric disaster ready? When we look at it, there was always that all hazard disaster preparedness section. Um, looking at written disaster preparedness plans that address pediatric specific needs within the core domains, including your medication, vaccines, and equipment. Um, looking at pediatric surge capacity for injured and non injured children. And I know a lot of hospitals have had to do that. Um, in the later months of last year. 
Um, looking at, do you have a process for decontamination, isolation, and quarantining of families and keeping them together with children of all ages? Really keeping that parent child from being separated. And then, how do you track and reunify children that come in potentially without their parents? Um, looking at access to specific behavioral health therapies in disasters and having drills that include children. So, why are disaster plans important? Um, why do we need dis pediatric disaster preparedness? Um, everybody knows that children are not small adults. They have special needs based on their physiological, anatomical development and cognitive attributes. Um, everything is always based on weight for them. Um, developmentally and cognitive levels may impede their ability to escape from danger. They may not be sure what to do. Um, age and cognitive development may not be sufficient to convey medical history. They can't tell you who their parents are necessarily if they're separated. They, can't, they may not be able to tell you how old they are. Um, weight for medications are all weight-based in kilograms. So being able to know how much they weigh. Um, supplies are all based on also their weight. Um, children with chronic condition and special health care needs are particularly vulnerable. Um, if children, if they do survive, it depends upon medications and their technology to keep them going and keep them alive, such as those kids that are ventilator dependent or require continuous infusions if there's no power, having processes for that for those families. Higher respiratory rates put children at risk for greater exposure to um, if there's something that's aerosolized into the air. Um, more they have more permeable skin and larger skin surface to mass ratio, which increases their exposure risk to some biological and chemical agents. This also increases the risk for hypothermia. Um, they also have increased vulnerability to radiation exposure, requiring a more vigorous medical response. So lots of reasons why it is so important to make sure that they are included in plans across the US. Some of the NPRP disaster questions is are asking, does your hospital disaster plan address issues specific to the care of children? Um, for example, pediatric surge capacity, patient tracking and reunification, pediatric de decontamination. And then if yes, does your hospital disaster plan include each of the following? Do you have the availability of medication, vaccines, equipment, supplies, and appropriate trained providers for children in a disaster? Um, do you have decontamination, isolation, and quarantine of families? Do you have a process? Does your plan include that for families and children of all ages? Does your plan include minimizing parent-child separation and ways to reunite those families? And do they include drills that include pediatric patients? Um, one of the children in the event of a disaster. Does your plan have something written in about that? Does your area have something in around that? Experience of a disaster? And then the care of children with special health care needs with developmental disabilities. Some tools to help us assist with this is the EIIC disaster domain. Um, created this this past winter in 2022. It's a checklist for essential domains and considerations for every hospital's disaster plan. Um, this was a revision of the, I think, 2014 disaster checklist. Um, and this time we really broke it up in foundation, intermediate and advanced. So this will fit any hospital. Um, The foundation don't have necessarily dedicated pediatric inpatient unit. And then you have the intermediate unit, intermediate area where facilities that may have some pediatric services, and then your advanced, which are quaternary care. So when you look at our pediatric surge domain, um, talks about general surge planning. How do you augment and expand your capacity to include children, um, your surgical capacity? Do you have surgeons who can care for pediatric patients in a disaster situation 
and what can they manage and knowing what they can manage, I think is the biggest thing. Um, looking at your space, do you have space to care for them? Do you have the equipment and supplies, um, medication and vaccines for children? And then how do you bring in additional staff and ensure your staff are trained on pediatric disaster response? And this is what um, a snapshot of the surge capacity. So like I said, we break it into foundational. And then as you go up, you should the advanced should have everything under foundation and intermediate when you get to the advanced level. But even just looking at our basic general surge planning, um, emergency department capacity, uh, making sure you have extended care for up to 48 to 72 hours, potentially. Um, establish, establish a plan for accessing pediatric expertise in your community or your region, um, whether that be via te telehealth, in-person or phone consultations. And then also looking at surgical capacity. And then with the, once you get up to the advanced or quaternary, um, that would be the expectation that they are leading and coordinating efforts across the region regarding pediatric patients. You may have one hospital in your region or you may have many in your children's hospitals in your region that can help with this. Um, when we look at triage, infection control and decontamination, um, looking how you can include these kids in, how do you decontaminate a infant or a toddler? Um, you can use a clothes basket. It's thinking outside the box and planning ahead for those. Um, trying to disrobe a child can be more challenging than getting an adult to disrobe. Um, if you're keeping families together, you can have the parent help with that and disrobe the child. They'll be more comfortable. Um, sometimes with toddlers or young school agers, they're not going to want to take off their clothes for an adult that they don't know. Um, and getting families to work together. And then looking at disaster triage, does your state have a standard evidence-based disaster triage tool that they utilize? Um, do your hospital EDs use the same tool or have a disaster triage tool? Um, there's two examples here of Jumpstart and then Start, which are both disaster triage tools. Um, if your hospital has an inpatient neonatal or pediatric patients, do you have a triage tool for evacuation? Do you have the right equipment to evacuate them? Um, especially if you have a NICU or a nursery, do you have baskets that you can put babies in to get them out quickly? Or even if you're horizontally evacuating and not completely evacuating the hospital. Um, and I just shared the triage tool that was created by Stanford Health on resource allocation for inpatient. And it's the train tool. I am gonna take a break, stop for a second. And I know Vicki has done a lot of work at her hospital and I know she has to get off. So I wanna give her a chance to let you guys know some of the stuff that she has done in her area with hospitals. And then we'll continue our presentation, but I wanna give her a chance to let you guys know what she has done in her region. Hi everybody, I'm Vicki Peterson. I'm the EMSC coordinator in Iowa. and. Um, Rest assured, I can't come here and say we have a fabulous, extremely successful recognition program because our program just completed its pilot. So we have what we have are many plans, but the, the pilot, pilot went really well. And um, I think the subcommittee that created our program was kind of on to something and just want to share what we're doing. And um, maybe it's applicable to what you guys are doing, too. Our program. Um, we kind of took a, a kitchen sink approach um, at hopefully in the very best way to um, the, re, the recognition program and, and put in there all the requirements that we really wanted folks to have. And one of those is disaster preparedness. One is weight in kilograms. One is um, transfer agreements and guidelines. One is having at least one PEC, um, QI, participation in the NPRP, all the things that we want them to do, we just tossed it all in there. And um, so far, you know, at least in the pilot, um, they, they didn't really balk at that balk at that stuff. They, they are doing a lot of it already. And that's kind of the message that we send to them is we believe you're doing a lot of these things already. And anything that you're not doing, we would like to help you get there. And that was absolutely the 
the primary focus of this subcommittee who put this program together, they didn't want it to be another, just a scoring program, you know, another thing that tells you what you're, you're lacking in, but a, a really supportive environment where hospitals um, feel safe in asking questions and inventing the things that they don't know how to do. And then everybody shares resources and, and helps, helps them, you know, achieve whatever it is that they're looking to achieve. So that's what we're doing. With particular regard to disaster requirements, I had to do a lot of research on this because I, I didn't have a really deep understanding of what the requirements were for hospitals. But what I found is um, in, in every state, there is some sort of, um, some sort of, of certification program for trauma. Sorry, my brain just wasn't working. And in, in Iowa, we have a mandatory trauma certification and recertification program that applies to every hospital in the state. We have 117 hospitals, but 100 of them are the, the smallest possible hospitals. So we've got a lot of hospitals that you know are, are not blessed with a whole bunch of money or a whole bunch of people to get this stuff done. But we have our trauma recertification program requires each hospital to have disaster plans. And so we had that going for us. That was good. Also, um, and, and every state has some version of that. Most of them are dependent on the, the American College of Surgeons um, trauma criteria. So they would be the same. Some of them might be different. I'm not sure about your state. But um, we also have, um, whenever a hospital uh, is given the um, FEP or HPP funds, federal funding, um, there's also requirements for them to have disaster preparedness. So that's another kind of a layer of things that they're already doing. And so we were we were able to work with that as well. Um, also, I discovered that um, any hospital that takes Medicare or Medicaid funding is also has another layer of, level, layer of requirement um, for their disaster planning. And that one in particular, I found a lot of wording that regards um, all categories of people and visitors to the hospital. So if you say, well, we don't have pediatric patients or we don't accept pediatric patients, to me, the way I read it, that doesn't mean that you don't have to be prepared for pediatric patients that might come to you as a result of a disaster or might be there on site as a visitor. So I, I think there's there, there are some things in place where hospitals already understand that they need to have this stuff. Um, and so we threw it in. We have... Um, I know I, I told you about all the, the different requirements that we have in our program. We also have a checklist that's based on the pediatric readiness and the emergency department checklist. And it does include the, the section just straight out of the checklist in that portion um, about disaster requirements. And when we did our pilot hospital, um, they, they had everything that they needed. So I believe that the message to our hospitals is we know that you can do this. We want this to be achievable and we're going to help you get there. And so we're launching our program. We're hoping to launch it next month to all 117 hospitals equally. Um, and then it's going to be an optional add-on to the trauma re-verification process that happens every three years. So they will be able, their, their re-verification is mandatory, but they'll be able to optionally add this on and we'll get them in a three-year cycle of renewal. So it just becomes part of their, their re-verification and um, hopefully that'll make it an, an easy thing for them to choose. The pilot, we learned a lot. Um, but I think the concept really works and I'm absolutely 100% willing to share everything we have after we launch it to the hospitals because they're super competitive and they all want to know what the requirements are and that kind of thing. So I'm not going to send it out until I send it to everybody, but I, I believe in sharing uh, among our groups. And I think it's really important that we don't all reinvent the wheel, but that we help each other get there. Thank you, Vicki. That was great. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? <clears throat> yeah. I don't know if you have, do you have a couple seconds? Do you have a little sure. bit? Yep. Um, um, for you to expand a little bit on maybe, did you go, how um, you how you maybe presented to your trauma folks that this could possibly be an adjunct to what they were already doing? I know we, I think we covered a lot of that last time that we did a community of practice last fall, I guess it would be now, but any, um, any thoughts or how that went and how that worked for you? Hmm. I am fortunate that um, I work in the state. My EMSC organization is part of state government, uh, Health and Human Services in Iowa. And so I work with the trauma folks. We're all in the same department. And so um, they were super open to it. 
the whole way through. I ran into a little bit of um, concern about making sure that we keep optional add-on separate from mandatory because this, this is not mandated and, and we would need legislation to do that. Um, but so long as we keep it separate, um, we plan to, whenever we can, do site visits together and that kind of thing. And it just, it streamlines the whole process for all of the hospitals. We really haven't had a problem um, getting that out to people. And I, I did a presentation about the program to our trauma program managers group that gets together once a month. And they were really interested and excited. And, and I, I, I mentioned to them ahead of time that they would need a pack because I pushed that pack thing like a used car salesman everywhere I go. And uh, so I got a whole bunch of packs after that because they're just trying to knock out those requirements before they even have to. I, I think it helps that that they're fairly competitive with each other, you know, in geographical areas. And so they all kind of want to be first. I I really hope I have the problem um, of so many hospitals that I'm completely overwhelmed. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Um, but I, I hope so. I think that'd be great. I did something similar, Vicki, with pushing the PEC with, um, I was talking to our trauma program manager, our pediatric one, we're part of a large system. And she's like, well, like the EDs have to own this. And I'm like, you're right. The, if this is the ED has to own the new trauma guidelines. I go, the best thing you can do is encourage the trauma managers to try and get PECs at each of the EDs. And then we can work with them because I, I try and work with our PECs across the system to help them make sure that they're meeting the standards for disaster and trauma readiness. It's a lot. And I know it that is. they're very, very um, burdened already. Yeah. But there are, uh, the PEC system has helped a lot. We sent out a lot of pediatric respiratory surge materials through the PEC system that was well received. And um, so I think they're starting to see the benefit to being part of it too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one of the other tools going back here is um, looking at patient tracking and reunification. Um, there's ways to minimize separations of parents. We talked about that with um, decontamination, but then how do you manage those kids with special health care needs? Um, the AAP and Massachusetts General created this lovely family reunification following disasters. It's a planning tool for health care facilities on how to work through reunification just an adjunct tool for that. And I know there was a couple questions about the disaster tool. It is available on the website. And at the end, I'll go back and you can take a picture of the QR code and it'll take you right to it. And then how do you have exercises and drills that include children? Um, I don't know how many of you guys know if your hospitals are doing drills. Most hospitals do with drills and they may occasionally have teenagers, but really assuring that they're also looking at infants and children and all their exercises and drills. Um, so when, if there is an event that includes them, you know how to manage them and you know that you have the right equipment and tools to do that. Um, some of our lessons learned, um, most community EDs do not include, like I said, young children in their exercises and drills. And really it's so important to have a fan rep on your disaster committee or a family advisory representative on these committees because they can help with a lot of this stuff and help give you tips and tricks on how to have children or even include children in your drills. And I am gonna sneak back to, if you snap on the QR code, this should take you directly there and I'll try it after I'm done presenting here, get put the link in the chat as well. Okay, thank you. Do you guys have questions? Thoughts? So we'd really like to use this time if any other, if anybody else today who's joined has examples of disaster specific criteria that they've included and maybe had <clears throat> some successes with particular items or some pushback or things that didn't work. Um, we, we would love for you to share um, if you if you feel, you feel the opportunity to do so. 
I could just make a couple comments. Um, a few years back in 2018, many of you who were with EMSC then will remember that we had launched um, a quality improvement collaborative called the Pediatric Readiness Quality Collaborative. And one of the areas of focus was somewhat exploratory and it was focused on exactly this, on um, the disaster preparedness efforts and work. And you know, when you hear this whole checklist and toolkit, th there's an awful lot to it, and it may seem overwhelming, especially when um, we have sites that aren't yet adopting 100% of pediatric readiness, um, and then to get into all of the very specific components of disaster preparedness work. But I think there's a few things to just comment on. One is that um, in our Pizza Ready Quality Collaborative and work that's been built up since then, led by Brent Kasney and others, um, there's really been a focus on how do we build out drills and exercises internally, assess our own surge capacity, and make sure that we're heavily engaged with our regional healthcare coalition. So those can be a few really easy first steps in terms of the disaster plan. Does it include children? Are we, you know, doing regular pediatric uh, focused disaster drills? Um, are we able to assess our current surge capacity and are we collaborating with our regional healthcare coalitions? So those are some pretty easy initial um, pieces to start with. Um, you know, as we begin to build out these programs, I think there are other opportunities that will become easier. But one of the other great benefits of in, uh, including disasters and the benefit I think to sites that are making efforts to include pediatric disaster planning in their work is that it provides opportunities for partnerships in arenas that we previously, some of these hospitals previously may not have had partners. Um, so whether that's regional healthcare coalitions or community partners, primary care pediatricians and the like, all of whom are you know, typically involved to some extent in um, regional disaster preparedness efforts. So just wanted to mention those, but it's really about starting somewhere and then beginning to build upon that over time. Yeah, and when you look at the toolkit, it is a lot. So just taking like one or two sections at a time and going through to see where you guys are, you, you'd be surprised. We did this with one of our, our community hospitals that's in a more rural area. And they weren't necessarily meeting everything, but they had, they felt that they could meet all the needs on the foundational level, um, which is where they're at without doing much work. So I think hospitals are doing a lot of this stuff. They just may not recognize what they're doing as the, how it fits into the disaster toolkit. In your area to help you with this as well. So as um, Lisa has mentioned previously in uh, September in um, concert with the all grantee meeting, we will be working to launch another pediatric readiness recognition collaborative um, to support some of your efforts. And um, there are a few opportunities and areas for focus and you know, I just want to reflect on the fact if you look even at, you know, stroke, trauma, STEMI center criteria, the verification criteria evolve over time and they evolve because more and more data comes out or we have more and more experiences with the impact of, you know, various factors on healthcare. So this is a real opportunity, I think, for those of you who have programs to really look at the criteria and reflect on how it aligns with, um, you know, the data that we now have related to mortality and what what are the elements of pediatric readiness that are most critical in um, ensuring overall readiness. Um, it's also an opportunity to potentially expand um, into the EMS setting uh, where we've, you know, we'll be looking next uh, meeting next quarter on um, EMS recognition programs and how these can really align um, to support regional readiness. And then, you know, lastly, as we've just discussed, is um, how we can begin to expand recognition criteria to ensure 
It includes uh, components of pediatric disaster planning so that as a nation, we become much more resilient. And I think we can, you know, as EMSC um, champions, uh, we can help to be the drivers of much of that work, which is exciting, so. Any thoughts, any comments from anybody on the call? Hey, this is Anna in New Hampshire. Can y'all hear me? Yep. Yeah, I was wondering if y'all could speak to um, the verification process and this you can either go to Vicki where she's already put this in plan or already, already put this in practice, but um, New Hampshire and certainly uh, uh, as many other states that I've spoken to about it are concerned about the bandwidth of program managers having to do um, verification just in general, both ED and um, pre-hospital, um, but specifically in-person verification. We only have 27 EDs in New Hampshire, and I know I can't go in person to verify their NPRP results, um, excuse me, the NPRA results. Um, but then thinking of other states who have many more, like uh, Iowa said, Vicki said, you know, over a hundred. And then when we get to the pre-hospital agencies, it becomes even more uh, profound where we're having hundreds, uh, if not thousands of agencies in the state. And I'm just wondering if anybody has an idea of where it's going to go as far as verification, uh, both the, the requirement of it, but then also the reporting of it back to HRSA. I'm happy to start that. And Sally, I know you're on, so I might pull you in to <laughs> offer a couple comments as well, coming from the great state of Texas with uh, 500 or so hospitals. Um, so there are ways to streamline verification. I think, you know, first and foremost, the reason that verification is valuable actually came out of some work we did back in um, 2013, published in 2016 on the role of verification. And what we found when we looked at um, emergency departments that either weren't, aw weren't really aware of pediatric readiness, were aware of it, and there had been some advocacy com campaigns locally versus those that were actually verified, there was a significant difference in their readiness score. And a lot of sites were um, stating that they had components, but may not actually have them in place. Um, they thought they had them, or at one point they had them, but at this juncture, you know, they can't find that policy or it doesn't exist. So the verification piece is a way of holding sites accountable. And it is definitely associated with a much um, greater likelihood of meeting um, the components of readiness that are specifically called out. What a number of states uh, have done, and folks feel free to chime in and talk about your process, but what a number of states have done is to develop a fairly robust application process where sites are um, submitting a lot of details about the readiness. So it's not simply the NPRP assessment, but um, it might be uploading policies. It might be adding what they do for quality measures, maybe submitting some reports um, that they've been able to download, things like that, that aren't necessarily patient, uh, like protected health information. I, I wanna be clear about that, but reports on kind of performance and progress and what they're doing and how they're, they're going about their quality improvement work. So having a robust application process allows you to kind of streamline um, what exists and where there might be opportunities or gaps. And if a site doesn't have certain components, you can highlight those and request that those be fixed prior to a visit. Um, but the visits don't actually have to happen in person. And in fact, we've had a lot of success with virtual visits. Um, when sites log into Zoom, for example, bring um, their leadership team into a meeting, talk through different components, you get to meet the PEC, you get to see policies, they can pull out specific charts and even begin looking at them and talking about what they did in certain cases, if you're doing chart reviews, things like that, but lots of opportunities to do this virtually. And they don't have to be all day visits. I think it depends on how streamlined the verification process is, but you could probably do this in as short as one to two hours or as long as, you know, a full day visit or a couple day visit, but um, there are ways to design it to make it more streamlined. But Sally, please add your comments in the state of Texas. Thanks, Kate. I would just say that the most important thing about this whole thing is the ownership of pediatric readiness um, in the emergency department. You have to, as a trauma program manager, you have to collaborate very closely with the leadership, both nursing leaders and physician leaders in the emergency department, because they're the ones who have to own this. They have to, they're the ones who have to get pediatric ready in the ED. Um, I think the PEC role is very important um, 
we in Texas, like Kate said, have 560 hospitals. We have 305 trauma centers. So those are the hospitals that we're concentrating on um, in terms of the pediatric readiness component of now trauma verification. Um, and, and just working with groups like um, Vicki was talking about, the Tra Texas Trauma Coordinators Forum is a 20 year old, old organization um, and is the resource go-to for all trauma program managers at every level. And we worked with them, we've talked to them, we've presented to them. Um, the other way we do this through uh, our trauma program is through the regional advisory councils of the Texas trauma system. We have 22 regional advisory councils in the state and we are trying to hit every one of those that will give us an opportunity to talk about pediatric readiness. Um, and to Kate's point, the virtual um, assessment process for us has been very successful. We typically do about four hours and we'll have uh, people upload their um, policies and procedures to a box file so that we can review all that stuff in advance. And if we have questions about something they need to change or add or tweak a little bit, we're in, uh, prepared in advance to do that. Um, and that virtual assessment has really worked well for us. I think in the future, we're going to try to do a few on-sites uh, just to see which works the best for us. Um, and I am now going to be the uh, Texas EMS for Children um, consultant to do, uh, a, to, to provide a liaison role for P our virtual pediatric readiness a recognition program. Um, I don't mean virtual, I mean voluntary pediatric recognition program and the PECs in the state. So um, hopefully we'll get some um, more participation. And I think that it, it, it was a major coup for pediatric readiness for the ACS and in our case, the State Department of uh, Health to put the participation of pediatric readiness in the trauma rules. Um, the other thing I'll say about uh, the, the, the GAP report, uh, when you talk to emergency department leaders about um, how they will address the gaps that are identified, I kind of like to um, equate it to the pre-review questionnaire. Trauma program managers understand the pre-review questionnaire. You have to address every recommendation from your previous visit in your pre-review questionnaire. And that's kind of what you're gonna do with your gap report. If you get a gap report that says you need to weigh in kilograms, you're gonna address that in, um, in your gap report. So um, I think it's the most important thing I've talked about is collaboration and partnership between the trauma program and the emergency department. Neither one of those people wants to be told what to do by the other, but collaboration is, is really key. Thanks, Kate. I have, I'll just add on one bit piece about bandwidth in these virtual visits. Um, yeah, Michelle just stated in the comments, I think that the ACS found that those virtual visits are a lot less um, grueling for site reviewers. And I, I know that there's a lot of discussion around moving to, if you're a brand new program, you'll probably get a one hunt, you'll get a site visit. But in the page ready world, we could look at it as if you found, um, you found some significant gaps in their in their documentation and things just don't seem right to you. Maybe that's that's an ED that might might you want to focus on actually going to that site. But those that um, submit their documentation and things look very thorough and they have seem to have many many processes in place, perhaps a virtual um, a, a virtual visit would would be the answer. So maybe a hybrid approach could be an option as well. One of the things that we did as part of our program was to make sure that they had fulfilled all the requirements of the application before we scheduled a site visit. So once they get to the site visit level, hopefully, you know, at least on paper, they have every requirement that they need for recognition. And the site visit is really a confirmation. When we did the, the site visit for our pilot hospital, um, we did it because everybody on the subcommittee wanted to be there, but not everyone could be there. So we did it combination virtual and in person. And I literally put my laptop on a rolling cart and rolled it through the hospital and showed everybody everything. And it worked out okay. I, I think we could do that. We also talked about maybe um, requiring that they have an in-person site visit at least 
like every third time, if not every time. And the other times could be virtual unless they had an issue like you guys talked about. But yeah, that is a question that I have because we have more than 900 EMS agencies and there's no possible way we can do site visits for all of those agencies. So we'll need some help with that when that comes up too. I wanted to tell you guys too, um, one thing that I wanted to say and I forgot was that, you know, there's a lot of requirements for disaster planning, but I think what's important is making sure that the spirit of it is fulfilled. You know, that the really significant things are actually happening, not just that we can check a box and say, yep, we have a plan. The plan might be 15 years old and not applicable anymore. But, you know, just I, I, what we're looking for and what we're asking them to show us is um, how, how will this really look? You know, where is this equipment? Where is this? You know, let's look at your your PEDS crash cart and make sure that everything's in there. Just things that are really practical that'll make a real difference and quickly for them. We're not coming to questions. We've been a great discussion. I think it's helped some helpful to answer some questions that we've had. So oh, Rachel posed a question in the chat box about whether anyone has leveraged state um, licensure or state-led inspections of EMS agencies for part of the uh, verification process. So because nearly every you know, uh, EMS agency, they have to go and do an on-site inspection and licensure. Um, the suggestion being, is there a way to incorporate um, EMS recognition, pediatric recognition criteria in that inspection process? Um, even if it's just a few key components, I think um, that in, in combination with an application could really help offload a lot of that work. Thanks for that, Rachel. For my awareness, how often do those happen? Do those occur? It's variable by state. Um, some states it's yearly, others it's every few years. So, but I think most states it's annual. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, good. Okay. I wasn't sure this was working. Um, so this is Eric from New Jersey. We do actually um, leverage our inspection ability of our ambulances. Um, and we're currently in a rewrite process of our regulations, and this is going to be um, included in our rules. So we will be able to um, check randomly or um, at, regu at uh, regular um, biannual required vehicle inspections. So, you know, and we're making it part of the licensure requirement for agencies that have PECs and those types of things. Uh, in order for us to meet these types of uh, objectives. Now, it'll probably take two years to get there, but. <laughs> Wayne, you have your hand up, go ahead. I do, thanks. Um, so PA has, since they implemented the EMS recognition program, has included it in a licensure inspection that's done through one of uh, a dozen plus uh, EMS regions, and there's a uh, form for the additional equipment that's required, and then the regions are made aware of what agencies are recognized at what levels on a fairly regular basis, and it's available at, on the MSC website as well. Um, the PEC got added to the licensure application in that when they're completing their triannual relicensure information, they're asked who their pediatric emergency care coordinator is, and that's how I'm able to increase my engagement with them because of that contact. Now, as Eric said, it's it's a, a period of time, and I believe that question has only been asked for the last two years of cycle, but it's very good that the Bureau of EMS is engaged with having that component uh, both in site inspections and also in the relicensure process. You now, as we continue to move forward, we'll you know, have more compliance with having a PEC and also with um, the agencies that are recognized, ensuring that they have the right equipment.
Thank you for sharing, Dwayne. Hi, this is Erica in Wisconsin. Um, we have completed our first site visit and um, found that um, that policies and procedures are really a big challenge for the challenge for the community emergency departments and that oftentimes they might not have the expertise or um, bandwidth to develop pediatric specific policies and procedures. As it pertains to disaster, um, I, I really like the new disaster checklist, um, but I think something that could really help the community emergency departments would be like sample um, disaster policies and guidelines. Has there been any discussion um, amongst other states or um, on a national level to develop sample um, disaster policies and guidelines? Eric, I don't know of any um, examples being talked about, but I do know that it doesn't have to be a separate policy. They really should include this in the, if they're a adult focused hospital, it just makes sure the pediatric considerations are included throughout the policy when they're looking at different sections of it. The, the one thing that I'm, I might add um, though, Erica, is that the Pediatric Disaster Centers of Excellence are doing a ton of work um, to develop educational materials and products. And it might be worth going to the Region 5 for Kids, the G7, and the RAPM websites to look up some of their educational resources. In addition, the Pediatric Pandemic Network has a knowledge and education uh, core that's working to develop a ton of educational resources that could be used for implementation, as you said. And I think you'll be seeing a growing number of these um, evidence-based or consensus-derived uh, guidelines in the coming years, but I would certainly reach out to those disaster groups in the interim if you have questions and they might be able to help you uh, track down some specific recommendations. And I could take that to Region 5 as well to see if we have, can get to collaborate and get some examples that we could put on the website. That would be awesome. Thank you. I appreciate the feedback. It's Dwayne again. I do have kind of one question based on what I'm, I'm seeing here in Pennsylvania. Just pre-COVID, they had developed a pediatric annex that was part of, as mentioned earlier, the ASPR effort to um, supplement the readiness for response and including pediatrics and disaster response and preparedness. Uh, and throughout COVID, it, it kind of dawdled, but they've re-engaged that effort through the healthcare coalitions in Pennsylvania individually uh, the challenge is the document is 90 plus pages. And I think people, you know, small hospitals or almost any hospital will get lost in the paperwork. Um, is there anybody else that's seeing an effort uh, at the you know, state level or regional healthcare coalition level to uh, adopt some standardized approach to, you know, the pediatric disaster preparedness and readiness for hospital ED so that each hospital is not reinventing the wheel, but at least it's applicable in a regional or state approach versus you know, uh, some guidelines that might not be applicable in a particular area because you know, it's not a consideration or it's, you know, it's not functionally part of the, the role that the state requires the facility to follow, things like that. You know, not everything's the same state to state, so that's why. I, I look at things a little bit more locally than that and trying to apply things so that they're implementable versus just a, a document, a statement of do this you know, when they really can't or, or, or don't have the capacity to. But is anybody else seeing a statewide level or a regional level versus an individual hospital level of preparedness? I know um, Charles is on from the PP, and I don't know if he wants to comment, but I'll, I can just start um, by saying that um, 
those COEs, those pediatric disaster centers of excellence are doing just that. They're trying to create kind of the, the standardized approach. And that's a lot of what's come out of region five and wrap them and um, that what will be coming out of G7. Um, and I, you know, the value of those programs is that um, it's shared best practices as opposed to everybody doing their own thing. But uh, Michelle, maybe you want to speak to that. I know. Um, I know we have a lot of different work groups working on different things um, as far as like disaster plans and looking at it regionally. I don't think we've ventured into that, but I think it's a really good idea as we move forward. I think the intent of the, um, I apologize if I'm coming in and out, just let me know. Um, I, certainly the intent of the um, ASPR was to create a national model based on regional pockets of shared best practices that could engender a standardization. What um, each of those ASPR COEs were really intending to do these areas of expertise. We could lead discussions on telehealth, on antibiotics, on uh, reunification. And so was practice at uh, either a smaller area, a region. And what you gain out of that is not just um, an easier way to approach it, but an economy of scale. If I, as an institution, um, can check off the box for the number of drills that I'm attempting to conduct with regard to uh, a mass shooting alert, um, then it makes it much easier to You'll see the um, checklist uh, that will help identify risk in children in disaster and the product of those efforts standardized. Charles was breaking up a lot there, but but hopefully you gathered that a lot of the, the goal of these ASPR COEs is to develop standardization um, for adoption on a, a broader scale or across the region. Thanks, Charles. Does anybody like to speak to their recognition process? Um, you know, several folks are answering in the chat for Dr. Edwards' question, but anybody like to speak to their process of what, what you do after a, a facility is, or an ED is recognized? So please feel free. We created a package that they can use in whatever way they want to. We do um, a press release and we do social media release and we provide them with certificates. And then we have templates for things they can print on their own, like a, a template for a banner, um, posters, uh, badge stickers, things like that, that, that they can use if they choose to, because we don't have the funds to provide that stuff. We give them the template and they uh, printers proof and they can take it and have it made if they want to. We're at the top of the hour. We certainly have 30 more minutes blocked. If anybody has anything else to, to contribute. The one thing I wanted to add is if you go to the um, EIAC page with the checklist, um, we did do um, some learning sessions with um, Michigan group um, and on the pediatric surge capacity, tracking and family reunification and children and youth with special health care needs. And those session recordings are right below the toolkit. Um, if those are areas that you think that your hospitals or your region needs to work on them.
All right, hearing no further comments, I appreciate everyone's time. I appreciate Michelle and Dr. Mick sharing their expertise. Um, so glad you find it. We've had a great um, discussion. And this this recording um, and the slides that are, um, uh, the slides with it, excuse me, I can't keep my words out. The slides with it will be posted on our EIC website under um, Community of Practice. And I look to um, seeing you all again for our next Peace Ready Recognition Community of Practice in April. Have a great day.